Welcome, everybody, to the Diverse Professionals Network. This is the live podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, man, I really appreciate each and every one of you guys for either accepting my invite or registering online. Thank you so much for taking the time today to, to listen on in, to tune in. Man, I am so excited for today. We have a wonderful guest. We have Jared Barnes uh, from the Minority Entrepreneurship Institute and Capital Fund. He's joining us from L.A. So, Thank you so much, Jared, for coming on in. Um, really just uh, to give an introduction to what we're doing here at the Diverse Professionals Network. We're creating a network where people can discover and support minority businesses, entrepreneurs, and leaders in the community. So you can learn how minority leaders use a mindset of growth, leadership development, emotional intelligence, and financial literacy to overcome adversity in the midst of change. So join the network today. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, contact me or visit the website and fill out a form. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining. I can't wait to get started. To just give a little brief introduction to Jared Barnes, uh, he's a son, he's an explorer, he's an innovator, he's a competitor, a friend, and a venture capitalist. Everyone, can you welcome Jared Barnes? Thank you, Jordan. Really, really appreciate the introduction. Excited, excited to be here uh, and jump into the conversation today. So thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man, I really just have to start off. So I, I kind of set in the stage for everybody. How can we, how do we kind of got here today? Um, so, man, I one thing that I always admire about Jared is is how far we kind of go back. And so to kind of set the stage, I, he, he is closer to, to my sister's older sister's age. And they went in, in school at uh, Worthington Christian, and they were doing a trip down to Jamaica. Again, I thought nothing of it at the time. I was probably in middle school, and, and we, we were even talking about it. I mean, that's 10 plus years ago. Yeah, yeah, that, 2010. So yeah, 11, <laughs> almost 11 years at this point. <laughs> that, that, that's so crazy. So that's that's how I remember Jared Barnes back from the and, and one thing that I always admired about him, he was working hard, training hard to, to get to the D1 level for football. So that's kind of where my admiration started with you. And I've just been kind of watching you uh, grow and develop as a leader, as an entrepreneur, and now as a venture capitalist. And it's just been so exciting. So I just thank you so much, uh, you know, for, for taking the time to talk with all of us today. So really, I have to ask you, so how did you go from attending a small school in Ohio to playing for the Ohio State University football team, to being a coach for Ohio State, to starting Prime U, to working for the LA Rams, and now as a managing director of the Minority Entrepreneurship Institute. I just want to say that's, a, that's an amazing journey. I, I, that's something to celebrate. So kind of give us a little bit more about your background and how did you tell us a little bit more about that journey and how you got where you are today? Yeah, well, again, first, really appreciate the introduction. I mean, first and foremost, I mean, there, there were so many people who have influenced me along my journey. So I would be remiss if I just sat here and said, oh, I did this, I did that. You know, it is it has definitely been a journey, but I'll definitely share about some individuals who have been key just along that way. But, you know, Jordan, it really started with exploration, right? You mentioned how, how we met. Uh, I, I grew up uh, in Columbus, so grew up uh, uh, in Westerville, uh, went to Worthington Christian High School, ended up transferring to Westerville South. Uh, but growing up, my mother and I, we would always go uh, over the summers on mission trips. So we visited Jamaica, visited Honduras. Um, and when I got to college, I ended up going to Trinidad and Tobago and also Tokyo, Japan. And so exploration has been a huge part of my life and, and part of, in a sense, my identity, how I even see myself and have always made efforts to just continually push the boundaries, explore, grow my perspective. And what that's done, it's it's accelerated a lot of the passions I've had uh, and, and be able to be exposed to some phenomenal things. Football has been a huge part of my life and been a great vehicle to exposure. Uh, I mean, even just unique journey and getting to the University of Louisville and even more unique in getting to uh, Ohio State. Uh, grew up loving the game. Uh, was not necessarily the most talented athlete. I was like a two-star two star recruit coming out of high school. You know, I was a decent player. I wouldn't even say good. I was just decent. Uh, so I ended up Man, I ended up emailing every single Division One school uh, at the NCAA at the time. At the time, there was 120 Division One schools, so I emailed every single school. Yeah. Only three, only three schools responded, and wow. one of them was the University of Louisville. So I ended up going to the University of Louisville, trying out for the team. So the first day on campus, I, I didn't even make the team yet. That wow. wasn't guaranteed. So I go there, 
uh, made the team on my first day of school, on uh, first day of class. Um, uh, my coach at the time uh, ended up looking at me right in my eyes and said, Jared, you will never play here. Uh, and I was like, man, challenge accepted. <laughs> uh, ironically, a year later, um, through just a lot of grit and so many of my teammates lifted me up, I ended up uh, starting on special teams, earned a scholarship, became the starting safety the year after. Um, and the coach who I played for at the time, Charlie Strong, ended up leaving uh, to University of Texas. Uh, and so at that time, I ended up transferring to Ohio State, have a chance to go play with some phenomenal players and phenomenal coaches um, and Urban Meyer, Greg Schiano, Kerry Combs. I mean, just so many great people. Uh, I was in the same class as Braxton Miller, Joey Bosa, Ezekiel Elliott. So around just a lot of talented guys, um, a phenomenal experience. Pursued the NFL myself, uh, ended up having a series of tryouts, but never made an active roster on the NFL. Uh, and so I knew I wanted to stay close to the game, didn't really know exactly what that next step for me was. Uh, so I ended up going back uh, to Ohio State and very similar to how I had mentioned, just exploration and continuing to put myself out there and grow perspective. I end up, not many people know this. I don't know if I've actually shared this publicly. This is maybe the first time I share this. Uh, I ended up going to, to Coach Meyer's office at the time. He was still the head coach. And I said, hey, coach, you know, I'm really passionate about football. I love the game. This has been a phenomenal experience here for me at Ohio State. And I would love the opportunity just to, to help and volunteer. He said, well, Jared, I don't have any, you know, open roles on our coaching staff, but you're more than welcome to just hang around. So I ended up hanging around, you know, for about a week, you know, sitting in on film meetings, so on and so forth. And I would notice during these film meetings that a lot of these coaches, you know, they drink a lot of coffee. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that coffee would get low. So as soon as that coffee would get low, I would take the cup, I would memorize that coach's coffee order, and I would fill it up. And that is how I got my start in coaching. So it started by filling up cup, coffee cups. Next wow. thing you know, it's, hey, Jared, would you be willing to set up a few drills in practice? Hey, Jared, would you be willing to break down this film cut up? Hey, Jared, could you take a few guys and, and coach them on this technique? Right. Next thing you know, it ends up into you know a full-time opportunity, join the staff, be part of the, 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 the team there, and um, end up taking another role down at Clemson uh, later that year. So... Man, it was just a really unique journey, but a lot of uh, humble beginnings from right. just my time as a walk-on, um, kind of being your own coach, uh, then you know, re re somewhat recreating that journey then as a as a coach uh, uh, itself. So it has been just a a phenomenal ride, and yeah, even now in this this world of, of venture capital, very very similar. Um, and just breaking into a really unique industry that there's so much opportunity for impact, so much opportunity to drive change and um, have just had a unique ride into the space and excited just to, uh, man, keep, uh, keep creating opportunity. Yeah, man, I, that's a fantastic story. Just, just from the start, to, I mean, start to finish as far as just, just what it takes to be a walk on at, at a D1 university. And you talk about grit. You talk about grind. You talk about not giving up. I mean, that that's just the ideal story. And I love that you, even like every part of your journey, you're always trying to find different ways that you personally can improve and as well as uh, improve around the people uh, around you and, and what you can do to go beyond. I mean, even to the point of sitting in those meetings, noticing and observing. I think it takes an incredible amount of awareness to notice what everyone is drinking and to make note of that and make memory. And like, as soon as it, it goes down, you're going to go beyond and you're going to get refill that cup, a cup of coffee and how much just that simple act that, you know, not a lot of people can think of or have the awareness to say, Hey, let me go, let me take that extra step. Uh, that's something that you typically give to interns. Right. And, and so the fact that you took that initiative and how that opened up and created other opportunities for yourself uh, and how that led to you being a coach uh, at the Ohio State University. I mean, that's just, that's an incredible journey. So, I mean, that's, that's awesome. Um, you know, so Urban Meyer often talks about the success equation. E plus R equals O. Your experiences or events plus your response will give you your outcome. So talk to me more about what that means to you and how have you used that to be successful today, especially as it relates to building teams and emotional intelligence. Yeah, you know, Jordan, I, I'll tell you what, that, that when I learned that concept at Ohio State as a player and coach, it was incredibly important then. But then you, you throw in everything that's happened in 2020 and even now in 2021, I, I would say it's even more important now where there's so many things that are outside of your control. So many things that, you know, in a sense, we, we, we can't necessarily um, have an influence over, but there are things that we can. 
So going through that equation of E plus R equals O, you're the event, you know, whatever it may happen that you can't control, but your response that you can, it really empowered me to think about what is within my locus of control. What is it that, that I can, you know, help dictate? Well, I can't, you know, help dictate, you know, a global pandemic. I can't help dictate, you know, in a sense, a social justice movement and, and all of these things that are happening in our world, but I can dictate how I respond, you know, to that. Uh, and I think our response, you know, why that equation E plus R equals O or the outcome, our response has a much heavier influence on the outcome that I think we realize. So it was such an empowering, uh, uh, empowering uh, equation for me. And as it relates to team building, right? I think a lot of times we will downplay our influence on other people, right? It's, it's I think, easy to look inward and, and focus on ourselves. We, down, we downplay the, uh, the influence on other people. And so there's a, a concept called the Pygmalion effect, uh, basically meaning that how you respond to a situation is going to have a direct influence on someone else and have a direct influence on their belief of what's possible and somewhat of this flywheel going around and around. So, you know, for me, I really thought about when it comes to team building, when it comes to emotional intelligence, being very self-aware internally, having a level of internal self-awareness about my action, my response, what would this mean for others? But then having that external self-awareness in, okay, if I, you know, respond this way, if I, if my, my tone is negative, or if I bring a layer of negative energy into this conversation, what is that going to mean? What is that going to do for others? It's a layer of second, like what's called second order thinking. Mm. Um, so that's really how I've used that equation just as a framework, you know, for myself, for some internal self-awareness, but also externally thinking about, okay, if I respond in this way, how is that going to affect others around me? Yeah. Dude, I, I, wow. I love that. I mean, that, that that's just so awesome. And, and like you talk about, it's so relevant for today. It's so relevant as far as we often focus on the events part of that equation. You know, we often focus on um, the, the, our experiences. And, you know, with that, that is completely out of our control. Like you said, that, that, that there's nothing that we can do about the events that happen, about our experiences that, that we have been given in our life. But one thing that we 100% have control of is that is our responses. And, and you talked a little bit about uh, your self-awareness, your, your, your identity and, and knowing yourself. Surprising enough, what, how did you get to that place? And, and, and for me, like it's a journey that looks different for everybody. And so how did you come to your own self-awareness and get to know yourself so that you can then have awareness of what you are doing and how that affects others, as well as, you know, then noticing what's going on around you? Great, great question, Jordan. You know, I think first and foremost, when you think about the great innovations of the world and, and great innovators, whether that's Apple, whether that's Tesla, whether it's Microsoft, these things are um, just category defining and world changing. It often comes from a high level of thoughtfulness, right, about that process. And so to reverse engineer that of what that means to me, typically when I think about innovation and creating change, sometimes you have to slow down before you speed up. And so, and I know we talked a lot about football, but also uh, as, a, as a solo entrepreneur at one point, spent a lot of time just with myself and my thoughts in reflection in really thinking about um, uh, not only my actions, but who I was, right? I had a lot of experiences where I would put myself out there, whether that's public speaking, whether that's pitching an idea, whether that's um, uh, in a sense, sharing a dream, right? Putting myself out there in situations there is no better way to find out who you are than when you put yourself out there, right? It's one thing from a sports analogy, right? It's one thing to, to stand on the sidelines and, and talk about what you would like to do. It's another to actually be in the game. And so for myself, as I thought about, hey, how can I, first of all, slow down to speed up and, and watch tape on myself and make sure I'm studying my own actions, but how can I make sure I'm out there in the game, right? Uh, and so I've really looked for those opportunities to put myself out there in order then to have a chance to reflect on, Hey, what just happened? Right. Mm -hmm. That was something new that I did. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm example, starting a podcast, I'm, you know, getting in front of people and outside, I'm organizing events. I'm, you know, creating a technology, things that you, you may not have done before. That is really, you find out, you know, adversity simply reveals who you are, mm -hmm. right? So it's not saying, Hey, go put yourself in bad situations, but I am saying, put yourself in situations where you're going to find out who you are, yeah. right? It's very hard to find out who you are, uh, you know, certainly staying at safe, staying safe at home in quarantine, but finding these environments 
uh, where you can continually to challenge yourself. Mm. That ultimately was the, one of the biggest takeaways I got from my experience as an athlete is, you know, in order to get stronger, you got to put weight on the bar. Yeah. Your, your legs aren't going to get stronger if you put the same weight on that squat rack. So how can you replicate that in your own life, whether that's as an entrepreneur, as a professional, as a father, as a mother, husband, wife, whatever it may be. Yeah, dude, man, I mean, one thing that I've really heard you saying is learning to, and we talked about this before too, learning to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And as you know, so, so what is that? How did you, how did you, a lot of people don't like to be uncomfortable. And I tell a, a lot of people growth is painful. You know, we talk about, you know, going to the gym, we talk about, you know, lifting weights the next day. If you had a great workout, more than likely you're going to be sore to the point where he can't even walk. <laughs> and it's like, what in somebody's right mind would want to do that to their own body? But it's the results after consistency and time that you did that over, that you created that habit, that you continually put yourself and challenge yourself to get to the next level, to grow and to, you know, be uncomfortable. And, and so um, for you, what did that necessarily look like? And how did you overcome that feeling of, being comfortable and, and staying in, in your lane and staying in your world. And, you know, uh, often, you know, we, we can take COVID, for example. I mean, that's a perfect example. You can be safe in your own home and nothing can go wrong. But how much are you really going to grow? You know, and, and how much are you really going to experience? How much are you going to be able to challenge yourself? So how did how did you how are you able to overcome that? And what would you give uh, somebody who, who wants to do that? How would, what would you give them advice to help them overcome uh, doing that? Yeah, it's a great question. And I'll say, number one, it's a continual journey. It's not a on off switch that all of a sudden you just flip the switch and now you're this completely different person. Uh, but it does start in your mind. I truly believe it's a mindset, right? It's really interesting. Back to just a quick football analogy, right? I played, uh, so I played defensive back. I played corner and safety. And I think it's so unique about that position, actually, ironically, very similar to venture capital is, you know, as a, as a corner of safety, you can be uh, wrong. Uh, you're, excuse me, you can be right 68 times, mm -hmm. but on that 70th time and you're wrong, everybody knows it, right? So it's a very <laughs> visible, very yeah. visible position where if you get beat or you're wrong, you mess up, you know, everyone's going to know. And mm -hmm. so there's a lot of anxiety that comes with that. And there was a mentor of mine who said, you know, Jared, there's a difference between playing to win and playing not to lose, mm -hmm. right? On the surface, they may look the exact same where you're competing, you're working hard, you're putting yourself out there. But at the end of the day, you're playing not to lose. You're still leaving a little bit left in the tank where if you're playing to truly win, right? I think Jordan said it best. He said, I'm more afraid of not trying than I am a failure, mm, right? Putting yes. yourself fully out there where at the end of the day, you literally have nothing left in the tank where you could have given more. Right? I think it is really unique in this world we live in. It can be easy to give 80% and that 80% look and feel really, really good, mm -hmm. right? I'm, I've lived it myself and it's unique, right? That I think there's a there's this, I don't even know how to what we'll call it, almost like a, a chasm that you cross when you go from that 80% into, you know, I'm giving full 100% of everything I have. It feels very vulnerable. It feels scary. Like, man, if I put my, full, if my best, what, what happens if my best effort is not enough or people mm -hmm. don't like my best effort? Mm. That is a very scary feeling. Um, uh, but that's what being an entrepreneur is, yeah. right? That's exactly the, the psychology of an entrepreneur. And so, you know, for myself, really, that's how I developed it was mm -hmm. just by having a, a level of belief. And you know what, I'm going to cho choose, I'm going to make a choice, and I'm going to put my full self out there. And even if somebody says no, I'm going to have peace with that, because I put my full self out there. And, you know, honestly, it's still a process I'm working on today. There's yeah. plenty of days where I don't put my full self out there. It's, you know, I, it's crazy. I was sending, um, you know, a, a presentation I'm working on for feedback to one of my friends. And, you know, you can say, like, hey, I would love to hear your feedback on this, but you really don't want to hear it. <laughs> right. You'd rather just share it and feel good. I really don't want to hear your feedback, but I'm just yeah. saying I do. Right, right. Um, just say it's good. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, right. Like, oh, you messed up on this, this, and this. It doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for myself, I have really leaned into that uh that tension right and, and back to what we were talking about of getting stronger right you think about muscles in the body 
And the longer you have that time under tension, my, mm-hmm. my, uh, my, ex- my major was exercise science in, in, in college, man. So the nerd in me is coming out. But the longer you have that time under tension on that bar, on the bench press or on the squat, that's the longer your muscles will break down, but ultimately grow back stronger. Right. Now, you don't want to have too much weight on that bar. Right. You don't want to have too much. You don't want to share overshare, you know, dream or aspiration with people who may not receive it. But you do need to put some weight on that bar enough to grow stronger. And, you know, I'll I'll kind of conclude with this in that, you know, it was um, four years ago now at this point, 2017, my uh, my father passed from a a massive Mm. heart attack and it really recentered me on my focus around time Mm -hmm. in that, okay, the longer I wait uh, to fully give myself to this world, uh, is the longer I'll have to wait to fully experience, uh, life in the fullness of that. Right. And there was certainly some hard times I've been through personally, professionally where, you know, I'm looking at my bank account and I'm like, you know what, this does not add up to the (laughs) the effort I am giving right now. This is, this is not good. 100%. Okay. Right. You know, we are, we are not in the green. It's going the wrong way. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've lived that. Uh, Mm -hmm. understand that journey but at the same token that level of peace from giving everything i had is what was able to get me through those Mm -hmm. moments um and now be able to give that back right i think a lot of times we think about our journeys individually and not necessarily the trail we are blazing for others um so this i mean this podcast is one something i'm excited about um uh too but also i think it's it's just so important to have that level of awareness about our own lives so I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm talking down. No, like, no, man, okay. this is exactly, this is exactly what I love. That, that was such good stuff, man. I mean, so many powerful things. And one of the things that I really love that you brought up, the time under tension, right? And, and, and you really think about what we often struggle with is our fear of failure, as well as, like you talked about, that your best is not good enough, Man, the perfectionist inside of me, it it, it definitely holds me back sometimes. And that's one thing that I realized about being an entrepreneur. It's not going to be perfect. And uh, the longer that I strive for perfection, the longer that I'm going to prevent myself from growing. And, you know, what helped change my mindset was uh, try to strive for progress instead of perfection. And seeing progress and growth inside yourself is so, so, so rewarding. So when we're talking about that time under tension, though, if you really think about the weight room environment, you have to have, you have, you know, a spotter, someone who's there, who's watching you, who's encouraging you, who's supporting you, who's going to, if you fail, if you're that time under tension, if I can't get that one last rep, you know, I'm going to, I'm giving my very best and I fail, there's, he's going to be there to pick me up. And so talk a little bit about how you were able to use your experience in the sports world and how you were able to translate that into um you know what what you're doing with with venture capital uh, venture capitalizing and uh, with the you know being at minority entrepreneurship institute uh and building teams how does that how are you able to translate that and then talk a little bit more about building teams with deep relationships yeah, it's a great question, right? I think I'll hit the latter part and then circle back to the, the first part, part of your, your question. I think in the latter part of your question, you know, what makes up a great team and to, you know, spent two years working with the LA Rams as part of our front office and you know, spend a lot of time thinking about personnel. At the NFL, at the highest level, being a great athlete is table stakes, right? The you know, NFL is all about personnel and matchups. That's why the draft is so important and the league spends a lot of time Uh, investing into player evaluation and getting the right person to be a part of this team. It's the exact same thing in venture capital and investing in great entrepreneurs and great startups is it oftentimes comes, comes down to, especially at the earliest stages, the team, right? You know, that, that is the number one thing we look at is the makeup of the team, their background. Is this a, a tight knit group? Is this the group that is going to, in a sense, create a movement with their product and take it to scale? That is exactly, you know, what we evaluate, what we look for. And so to reverse engineer that to the first part of your question, what makes that up? How do you, you know, where do you even start? I think you first have to start really with number one, what type of team is it that you want? Mm. And in order to know what type of team you want, I think you have to know what type of player you are, right? So you have to first know yourself back to what we're talking about, internal self-awareness. You have to know your own strengths, your own weaknesses. One of the 
healthiest exercises I've done is written a user manual on myself. Not as okay. if I'm like a robot or anything. Right. But, hey, if you're interacting with Jared, if, yeah, not, not like a, a <laughs> AI bot or whatever, but if you're interacting with Jared, you know, this is his, his strengths. This is, you know, what he's best at. This is where he thrives. These are areas where he's not as good at. These are his weaknesses, areas where he's trying to, you know, either grow or delegate. Right. You know, I've honestly really focused on doubling down on my strengths because sometimes if you just only focus on the weak, you'll you won't figure out ways to leverage your strength. Right. So when when thinking about building your team, it's it's being hyper aware of your strengths, hyper aware of your weaknesses. What can you grow in? What can you delegate? And so when you think about your strengths, how can you find others that either a complement that and help amplify that, you know, even higher or B are able to help supplement some of those weaknesses? Right. And thinking about personnel and decisions. So if I'm a great quarterback, but I have a terrible offensive line, it doesn't really matter how good of a quarterback I am because you right. have a terrible offensive line. Yeah. No different than a team. Yeah. If you are a great visionary and you love casting vision, but you are not an operator and tied into the details, those are just going to be ideas on a whiteboard. Yeah. Right. So it's understanding who you are mm -hmm. in order to find the right people to supplement, complement and ultimately have that um uh, uh in a sense category defining strength to go to the next level together yeah and it takes a, and, and i think the biggest thing is that building that number one takes trust mm. number two takes time it is not over i mean if you, if you want to know what it's like to build a team ask the brooklyn nets right now <laughs> james harden kyrie irving get you know what i mean like you can't just all of a sudden throw this roster together and think it's gonna mesh mm. it takes time because we're all human. We're all different people. I mean, you and I are completely different I and mean, we have different skill sets, different uh, uh, backgrounds, experiences, so on and so forth. That takes time to mesh. Right. And so, you know, what I found is the best leaders are not only obviously hyper aware of their own strengths, they're hyper aware of their people mm. and what their people's strengths are, what their people's weaknesses are, what their people's values are, what their people's uh, dreams and goals are. Right. And so that being able to be aware of all of that, will allow you to one, have a greater depth of relationship, uh, but also two, when it does come to those tasks, you're able to, in a sense, collaborate on a different level, right? Yeah. I think the the three C's of trust, this is something I got from uh, Urban Meyer just during my time at Ohio State, the three C's of trust, really the core of a heartbeat of a team are character, kind of back to those alignment of values, uh, competence, right? The, the fact that I trust that you are good at what you do. And then connection, the fact that I've spent time with you and I understand who you are as an individual, right? I think one of the biggest challenges in early stage startups, when you're building or you're part of a new team and you're leading the team is either A, you can feel misunderstood or you can misunderstand someone else. Mm -hmm. And the moment, you know, the number one inhibitor to learning, to collaboration is defensiveness. Mm. So the moment we start getting defensive and well, this person doesn't understand me and they don't know who I am and it, this isn't a good fit, that, that's going to be tough to get through. You have yeah. to spend some more time on that connection and that confidence to make sure there's no misunderstanding. So I think that uh, has been a huge, huge formula, you know, for myself. And then, you know, last thing I'll say is, you know, a great starting point if you're starting from ground zero and I'm building a new team is defining success. Right. The fastest mm -hmm. way, I think we had shared this before, the fastest way to find out uh, if you're on the same page with someone is ask them what their definition of success is. And if it aligns with you, then I would say you're on the same page. And if it doesn't, you might need to work that out. Right. Um, so, yeah, man, it, it, it's a multi-layered question. But those have been the elements I've found that have led to the highest success. That's awesome, man. I mean, such good content that you talked about. I mean, even talking about, like you said, the three C's, the, the character, the uh, connection and um, remind me of the third one. Yeah, I confidence. Do, confidence. confidence. I knew yeah. I, I had it in my head. I was like, oh, I'm going to. But uh, and, and also talking about the four elements, you know, understanding your strengths, understanding your weaknesses uh, and understanding um as well as your other your team's uh, strengths and weaknesses and how you guys all, all play into that and, and how you want to grow and what you can delegate. Once you're able to really, you know, lay those out and like you said, then define success, now you have a, a template of, okay, this is the direction that we're going and everyone can come along. Uh, and so I know culture is such a tough thing to really implement and not only implement, but keep as you grow. And so you, you talked often uh, a little bit about 
um, you know, it's not about grinding and working hard. It's a competitive world. It's all about systems and scale. So when, when you're scaling and when you're starting out, I mean, uh, and, and particularly maybe in your world as well, how do you scale culture? And, and what, what challenges have you seen in doing so? So that's a million dollar question, man. So when you figure it out, please let me know. <laughs> um, but no, man, it, 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 it's a phenomenal question. Yeah. Right? I think at the heart, at the heart, of what you're trying to do uh, by instilling culture and why you would want to do that is order in order to create repeatable success, mm-hmm. right? That that is the true purpose and intent of of a culture is to create a repeatable success and success in healthy relationships, success in your business model, success in winning whatever you know sector you may be in. Right. So I think it starts with you talk about what does it take to scale a culture? Number one, you talk about system and st- structures. It talks it, it starts with documentation. Right. You, I, I think you would be surprised. I, I talk to, you know, found, early stage founders every day. And I say, if you could describe you know, your company in, in one word and what really makes your team unique, you know, what would it be? And then I'll ask their co-founder the exact same question and I get two different answers. I'm like, Oh, that doesn't sound like you guys are aligned there, you know, so document documentation at an early stage, granted, you know, I think there's importance in in speed and and focusing on building a product service, whatever it may be, or focusing on getting, you know, a number of employees onboarded, but having things documented, there's so much power in written more power and visibility power and sharing in, and instead of, you know, saying, Hey, this is what we're doing, letting people know this is who we are. Because yeah. here's the here's the thing: when times get hard, it really doesn't. You know, people aren't as focused on what you're doing. Yeah. People are more focused on who you are, mm-hmm. right? You know, I'll be honest: in the peak of the social ju- justice movement after the murder of George Floyd in 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 uh, uh, May of last year, I'm, I promise you, not a lot of people were focused on. Well, this is what I do in my nine to five. More people were focused on this is what my organization stands for. So thinking of that, reverse engineering that, well, that is a unbelievably terrible uh, circumstance in, in, in crime, thinking about in those hard times that are coming, how can you be crystal clear on mm-hmm. this is who we are? Because mm-hmm. who you are is only going to be reflected in what you do, Yeah, right? It's only going to be reflected. So having that clarity of purpose, that is ultimately the baseline and foundation in order to one, be ready to scale. Because a lot of times what we see too, the other side of the token is you see incredibly talented companies, incredibly talented entrepreneurs, incredibly talented teams in sports and business, but they don't have that clarity of purpose. So when success does happen, they can't handle success long enough to truly hit that scale, right? You know, one of the most dangerous things that can happen to an early stage startup is to succeed too soon. Because then you may you may be on a stage that you are not ready for, right. right? And there's a lot of experience that can come with that, and you know things you can supplement. But at the end of the day, if you don't have that clarity of purpose, uh, that stage, man, it, it will simply like we talked about earlier, adversity simply reveals who you are. Same thing with scale; it simply yeah. reveals you know who you are. How you treat client number two uh, is going to be reflective of how you treat client number. 3,024, mm-hmm. right? It, it's, it's no different, right? You, you build those uh, uh, habits, you build those cultural norms. I mean, culture, if you look up the definition, it's simply just uh, an acceptable way to behave or perform in a specific subset or group. That's really it. It's, it's just a connection, a common language or it's unspoken, you know, piece there. So I'm rambling, man, but that's, man, what I, I get passionate about uh, this aspect. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, man, you just, I, I love that you just been spitting gems here and there and man, all, all such good things. And I, I love where you're thinking and, and talk about the foundation is defining your purpose. And, and that's one thing that I've been consistently hearing and being able to document and, and have people know what you stand for, your core values, your vision, your mission, and your core values. If you you know, can can get everyone to understand what your organization is about at that level and can get everyone else to buy into what you are about. That is one way that I've seen uh, culture be successfully scaled. Um, so everyone, if you have a comment, if you have a question, please drop it in the chat. Um, we're going to get around to these right now. We're going to transition over to the audience Q&A. So if you guys have questions, please continue dropping it in the chat. If we don't get it around today, uh, 
Jed has so kindly accepted that uh, if you leave your, your contact information with your, your question and we don't get it around to today, he's going to reach out to you and answer that question. So thank you so much, Jared, for doing that. Really appreciate that. Uh, but again, everyone, drop your comments, drop your questions in, in the chat. Uh, so we're going to get started with the first one from Jeffrey. Uh, one of the most important parts about being on a team is being able to know and accept your role. In your experience, what has been the toughest role you've had to accept on a team and how did you respond? That's a phenomenal question, Jeffrey. Really appreciate you asking that. I think, you know, there's two distinct uh, roles that come to mind. The first and foremost, from an athletic standpoint, uh, was being a backup, right? So I was a uh, backup safety uh, behind Mike Hooker and Von Bell uh, at Ohio State, who two phenomenal friends and teammates of mine, Malik Hooker ended up being I want to say the 11th or 12th overall pick in the uh, 2017 draft. Von Bell was like the 33rd overall pick right in the first or the second round. Um, uh, so two incredibly talented guys. I was their backup, meaning uh, I did the exact same amount of reps, did the exact same amount of film study, exact same amount of everything that the starter did, uh, but was not a starter. And that was incredibly humbling for me uh, to have that level of preparation yet not the same level of performance. Mm. Um, and so that was, it was really hard. And it was, uh, again, humbling. But I think for me, it, it helped me so much understand the value of preparation, but also the value of humility as well. Uh, when I say that is, number one, the value of preparation is that you never know when your moment may be here. You never know when that preparation may matter. You know, somebody in a, from an athletic standpoint, someone may get hurt in front of you from a business standpoint, um, you know, there may be an opportunity that comes up and someone thinks of you for, right? So you just, you never know when that call is going to, or that tap on the shoulder is going to happen. And so for me, it developed a habit of elite preparation every single time, regardless of if you are the one performing or not. And then two, from a humility standpoint, uh, I'd be lying if I said that was good with my ego, man. I did not <laughs> oh, enjoy. I didn't, I didn't. I didn't put in that amount of work to to be a backup, and and so what it did a phrase that a phrase that I've said to myself internally um, uh, when I experience you know adversity or disappointment is I say just let it burn, like let it burn. I think about when I was a kid and you put your hand on that oven and it burns you, and you know that you do not want that feeling again. So for me, when I fear, if experienced that disappointment, I've leaned into it. I say, let it burn. You know, like when I think about, you know, the fact that I wasn't able to make an NFL roster, I'm disappointed about that. That doesn't define who I am. But at the same time, I let it burn. And that's that's fuel, right? You can either let that be uh, almost like junk in, in your tank or you can let it be fuel, right? So for me, I've really tried to, hey, let me burn this junk and let it be, let it be fuel and allow me to, to grow and go instead of just, staying stagnant and complaining or being frustrated. Don't get me wrong, that doesn't take away the pain, that doesn't take away the frustration, that doesn't take away the disappointment, but what it does is it's given me fuel and allowed me again to have the humility when I enter a new team to quickly identify what my role is and allow myself to add the most value, right? Because I think what I also uh, learned through that preparation is that it allows you to serve people in a different way. So even though I was a backup, that's ultimately what made me such a great coach and opened up opportunity in coaching is I had to be my own coach as a backup because I wasn't getting the same amount of reps in practice. You know, so there was a lot of things that came about because of that at the time, which I didn't see. But it also took a level of humility and acceptance of my current state to be like, you know what? Hey, this is where I'm at. It is, you know, this, this is OK, uh, but I'm not satisfied. So, right. man, it is a continual journey of learning. But I think that was a great question. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I love that. Um, so to kind of go on to this next question, I know we're kind of coming up but here on time. Uh, so what would be the best feedback for improvement in the companies pitching to you and your fund? And does your fund focus on a specific industry, product or service? Great question. So high level about Minority Entrepreneurship Institute, we are a seed stage impact investing fund. So we invest typically uh, anywhere between uh, $100,000 and $150,000 checks into seed stage companies have an existing product in market or an MVP uh, that have some early signs of traction and have a scalable engine uh, for their business model. So we're sector agnostic. We don't specialize in any specific sectors, but we do look for very specifically what traction have you generated? Uh, have you done adequate layers of customer discovery? Do you have a scalable growth engine in place, meaning 
if we infused capital into your company right now, would that allow it to be a rocket ship or would that simply just uh, be gasoline along your journey, right? Mm -hmm. So we really look for those rocket ships. Uh, and then most importantly, uh, do you have domain expertise in the realm and field in which you are building? Right. So those are really the criteria at a very high macro level. Of course, there's my new you know, detail we look for, but that is our criteria. My number one encouragement I would give to early stage companies who are looking for funding is continue to build out your customer discovery and continue to build out and solidify a go to market strategy. Those are the two biggest gaps that I've seen in early stage companies is you may have a concept or a hypothesis that you are building. But the more people you can talk to who may be potential customers or users, the more insight you're going to gain. The only way you can gain insight is through observing human behavior and getting more humans and truly understanding, number one, what is the pain point or problem that you're solving? Is your solution a true solution to that? And then three, how many people would be willing to pay for that solution? And what is the true market size uh, in that? And then with that go to market, how exactly would you deliver that solution? right to that. It's no different than being a doctor. There are people in pain. You have a solution or a skill set that can solve that pain. How would you administer that? How would you distribute that exactly? Right. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Early stage, you're going to pivot, you're going to grow, you're going to transition. But that lets us know that we can have faith and belief in you as an entrepreneur that you're going to once be a good steward of this capital we deploy and mm -hmm. two make sure that it, it, it returns and there's revenue gener generated from it. Right. I think that is it's an incredible challenge. It is not easy, but it's possible, yeah. right? I think it just takes that layer of thoughtfulness and understanding exactly, you know, what we're looking for. So I hope that can be helpful. Awesome. That, dude, that was a fantastic answer. And that question was submitted by Samuel. So thank you, Samuel, for that question. Uh, last question that we're going to have here today. Uh, and then again, everyone who I wasn't able to get, uh, to today for the questions, we'll, we'll get out to you. We'll respond to you. So thank you for your patience with that. Um, how do, do you promote team building at the same time as encouraging individuals to reach their maximum potential in the workplace? That was submitted by Sue. It's a great question, Sue. I think as a leader um, or, or as a follower, or whether you're a mid-level manager and you're leading up or you're a, you know, a senior level manager and you're leading uh, your subordinates or you're an early stage and, and you're leading horizontally to those around you. I think it's very, very important to not only know your personnel and know who's around you, but to know their goals, right? I think the best leaders, the best coaches, the best managers who I've been around know very, very clearly their team members, who they are, what their goals are and what they are motivated by. And when you know what someone else is motivated by, you can have an influence and strategically place them in positions where they are going to thrive. And it, here's the thing, if they thrive, we don't live in a uh, zero sum world, right? It's, I truly believe the world is a non-zero sum game, meaning that there is not a scarcity of opportunity. So if a teammate thrives, therefore you will have an opportunity to thrive as well. And so it, it could be as simple as you as a coordinator and you know your fellow coordinator loves you know, a certain aspect about the company, but hasn't had an opportunity to collaborate on that project. And you may have access to that in recommending that they get involved, or you could be a senior leader and you know, one of your mid-level managers really wants to grow uh, and become a director and you provide coaching or you provide opportunities for exposure and allowing them to sit in meetings. That is what leads to engagement. That is what leads to the teams who are invested in each other, but it starts with knowing your people. Mm. If you don't know your people, if you don't know what they're motivated by, their goals, you're gonna have a real hard time trying to, you know, help them out. You know, yeah. so it, it trust takes time, but again, knowing your people, I can't stress that enough. Uh, and really sitting down and saying, hey, walk me through where you see yourself in, you know, next three to five years, and what is it you think we could collaborate on to help get you there? Yeah. Right. It, it, I think it's really unique that sometimes corporations avoid having that conversation. You know, but for me, it's you know, why would you? Why would you not want to be a part of your employees growth and development? Because you're only going to get a higher return from that investment than you are saying, hey, I need this, this and this done, you know, by next week. Right. right. I can do that. I can check those boxes. But if I know you're truly invested uh, in my own growth and development, how much more would I be willing to give? Mm -hmm. Right. And how much more would I be willing to invest into this company or into this organization? Because I know you have my back. Right. That right there. You talk about engaging millennials, engaging Gen Zs in the workplace. You, you hear all the time this generational divide and, oh, I, we can't reach Gen Z and I don't understand them. It's unique. 
It mm-hmm. takes a level of humility. It takes a level of time to invest and truly understand it. But I think that is exactly you know where it starts. Dude, I love it. it. Like you said, starts with knowing your people. And I think as a manager, that's the most important thing that you can do. One thing that I've learned um, that has helped me in my relationship with my manager as far as communicate my goals and motivations, because uh, that can be an awkward conversation. One thing that I kind of created is a template that we discuss my wins my improvements, um, my manager feedback or questions, and my goals. And so that kind of gives a really good uh, uh, element to drive the conversation as far as, okay, let's celebrate the wins. Let's celebrate what I can improve on. Uh, Let's know where I'm going with my goals and and agree on that. And then give some feedback or questions if you have any. But that's one thing that I've learned. Um, So thank you, everyone who who submitted those questions. I appreciate that. And to everyone who submitted questions and comments uh, in the section below, thank you so much for doing that. We'll get around to you. We'll respond to you. So again, leave leave your contact information. We'll reach out to you. Uh, one thing I want to do, I want to thank our sponsors. Thank you so much. Uh, the Sycamore Studio, it's a co-working space for creatives. It's a beautiful studio and they're building more. So uh, to check out the space, visit their website at the sycamorestudio.com. And if you're interested in renting out studio space, email the sycamore team at gmail.com. I also want to thank the Wilderness Agency. Uh, thank you so much for them. They, they focus, uh, they've been dedicated in helping minority businesses in the surrounding community since it starts. Several companies in this community struggle with driving new business, so they work with those companies to build out marketing tactics that will drive more leads or focus on how to increase conversions through their sales funnel. If you want to learn more, visit their website at wildernessagency.com and click Let's Get Started. I also want to thank Arc Media Services and Scomi Media. Thank you so much. If anyone is interested in being becoming a sponsor, please go to my page, contact me. We'll start that conversation. Uh, so thank you everyone for tuning in. And I just want to provide some next steps and invite everyone to the next live podcast. Um, and so one thing that Jared wants to provide, he, he, uh, created a a founder toolkit. It's a database of resources that he's built for early stage investors with the best practices across fundraising, business business development, hiring, et cetera. So we will send out that link to that toolkit. Thank you so much, Jared, for providing that. I know that's an incredible tool. So I know everyone out there who's interested in using that will send that in the the follow-up email. Um, Also, we'd like to ask people to think of three to five different qualities they would like to uh, build as part of their own team culture you know, one of the, and so, uh, submit that as well. So again, let's continue the conversation around team building and what building teams with deep relationships look like and how that is such an important factor into your success as an, um, as an entrepreneur. Um, so our next live podcast is March 5th at 12 PM Eastern. It's going to be Jelana Phillips. She's an author and founder of I set on, uh, it's, amazing workbook. Uh, She is still in college and we're going to talk about how to start and publish a book in a pandemic. I mean, just an incredible feat. So she is awesome. She'll be here and we'll be live. So I want to invite everyone to do that. So thank you everyone so much for tuning in today. Thank you, Jared, so much for just taking the time and for spitting knowledge all the gems that you dropped. I mean, just thank you so much for that. And I I appreciate our relationship and our conversations, man. And I look forward to to us uh, continuing that conversation. Again, everyone, he potentially the live uh, in-person event is going to be May 28th, which you will possibly get a chance to to actually meet uh, uh, Jared uh, there at the uh, in-person event on May 28th. So pencil that in. We're going to be flexible with what we got. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Look forward to seeing everyone everyone in person and can meet Jared Barnes here in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you so much. Everyone have a great day. Thank you so much, Jared. Thank you.